Welcome, everyone. I would like to introduce the authors of Collaborative Action for Equity and Opportunity. Paul Revel, the Francis Keppel Professor of Practice of Educational Policy at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and the founding director of the Education Redesign Lab. Ben Sachs, lecturer on education at HGSC and associate director of programs and research at Ed Redesign Lab. Paul and Lynn, you can take it from here. Okay, thank you very much, Mian. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, I see a lot of friends and colleagues and fellow travelers in the audience. Um, we're delighted to have you with us to talk a little bit about our new book, about which we're very excited. Um, and we thank you for joining us. I want to first, uh, you know, thank my colleagues at Harvard Education Press for all the help and support and editing and advice they've given us and being able to produce the book. I also want to commend my colleague, uh, Lynn Sachs, uh, for the work that she did, a lion's share of work in organizing us, organizing me in particular, to, uh, to do the work behind getting this book together. She did a very substantial share of the writing on this. Everything you like about this book is likely attributable to uh, Lynn. Anything that you have problems with, um, see me first. Um, uh, it's been a pleasure to work with Lynn on this. Um, this is not the great American novel. Um, it's not its intent. Uh, we tried to write here a, a down to earth practical uh, publication um, that would answer the question that we get from so many people when we make the basic argument that I'm about, about to make for collaborative action uh, for children. Uh, and people say, okay, we get the argument. What should we do Monday morning? What would this work look like? How would we organize to do this collaborative work? This book is an attempt to answer that provide, by providing strategy, guidance, and tips from what we've learned about collaborative ex action for equity and opportunity in our work at the uh, Education Redesign Lab. Uh, so just to give you a sense of where we're going, we're going to... Uh, uh, split up these slides a little bit. I'm going to do an introduction. Lynn's going to take over, and then I'll close it out. So uh, with uh, Mian's help, uh, we'll go to the next slide, please. So those of you who have been around me uh, at all will uh, know the basic argument, but for those who haven't, uh, you know, essentially it can be summed up as schools alone is currently constituted are an insufficient strategy for achieving all means all, uh, no child left behind, every student succeeds. Um, our basic premise of public schools and particularly of education reform as the great equalizer that somehow schools operating on 20% of a child's waking hours um, will be able to right gross inequities that exist in our society in the lives of children uh, is destined to failure. Uh, inevitably, schools will succeed and become life-changing for some, even uh, in some instances, many in particular schools or school systems. But on the whole, we have, next slide, a straight line correlation, as you can see in this work of Sean Reardon, between socioeconomic status and educational achievement and attainment. This is a... Um, graph that features in violet little dots that are the shape of each of the roughly 14,000 school districts we have in the United States arrayed on the horizontal angle from at the left poorer communities to at the right wealthier communities and on the vertical from three grades behind grade level on average to three grades ahead. And what you see is a straight Northeast line that correlates with socioeconomic status. Now, this isn't true for any individual, obviously. This is uh, generally true as we look at the large data. There are outliers in, in and you can see those dots, you know, some communities that uh, have low socioeconomic status but high achievement and others that have high socioeconomic status and low achievement. But in general, it is still the case that the best predictor of your success in US public education, as I might say in many other countries, is your socioeconomic status at the time of birth. That's not what America is supposed to be about. That's not what an equal opportunity is supposed to be about. That's not what our myth of public education is about, but that's reality. It's not a deficit way of thinking about things. It's a way of looking at the facts on average 
of how effective our school systems are in preparing children from various backgrounds to be successful in our society. Next slide, please. And why wouldn't that be the case? We've got gross disparities that surround us. This is just one locally. Uh, the same thing could be shown in so many venues nationally. Uh, in terms of the kind of wealth which defines uh, not only your economic capital, but in most instances, uh, your social capital. Uh, blacks in Boston, the city of Boston, greater Boston, have a net worth of $8 whereas whites have a net worth of $247,000. Next slide, please. The gaps are pervasive and, and extend across virtually every aspect of children's lives. And that's part of the whole premise here is that the factors involved in children's lives outside of school uh, are so consequential that they affect children's ability to A, come to school in the first place, and B, supply their best effort, focus, and concentrate when they get there. And the nature of the impediments ranging from nutrition to healthcare to housing stability to personal safety to clean air, clean water, um, that are the social determinants not only of health, but of educational success are just pervasive. And this is one slide uh, and the graph in which you see here represents in red communities where the majority of people who have mental health disorders do not receive any care. Uh, so there are alarming gaps in our capacity to, uh, to serve young people and to, um, to mitigate those factors that get in the, in the way of young people coming to school ready to learn. Next. So one of, the, one of the sort of paradigmatic flaws in the way in which we think about what we need to do for young people in education is we, we make an assumption implicitly, sometimes explicitly, that fairness is giving everybody the same thing. But if you have different challenges in life, particularly in your life outside of school, in effect, if the fence that you're looking at is higher, depending on where you live, and whether or not you've been isolated and marginalized, whether or not you're a victim of racism, whether or not you're coping with poverty and trauma, then you need different kinds of boosts in order to see over that fence. So equity is giving to everybody what they need, whereas equality is giving everyone the same thing. Equality is giving everyone a shoe. Equity is giving everyone a shoe that fits. In education, one of our primary flaws is a one size fits all system that assumes that everyone is average and we teach to the average. And as many of our colleagues have shown, there's no such thing as average really anymore. And particularly in this time of the pandemic where children's experiences have been so widely different, what children need is gonna vary widely. And their needs extend not just in school, but out of school. And the question is, what are we doing as adults? What are we doing as communities? What are we doing as educators uh, to meet those kinds of needs? And our tacit assumption has often been if they have needs outside of school that aren't being met by uh, uh, the uh, education system, that by default, it should fall to the families who themselves are challenged and the children's reflect this or by default, it falls to the school system, which is already overloaded with uh, policy mandates like achieving world-class standards for every single child, when before 20, 30 years ago, it used to be sufficient to get getting only some people to that high standard. Next. So in this moment, we have uh, both a time of great peril and pain and suffering, and we have a time of great opportunity, I think. One of the opportunities uh, relates to public consciousness. These inequities that exist outside of school in the lives of children in communities, the kind of factors that I've just depicted, have become much more readily apparent to the general public as a result of this crisis. Many people assume schools were taking care of all these things when they weren't. At best, they were putting a Band-Aid, for example, on hunger, on healthcare, on mental healthcare. 
Suddenly people assumed that because schools were closed, children weren't getting any of these things and they were right in that regard, but they hadn't been getting many of them anyway, even when school was in session. So there's a sense of urgency and attention that we haven't had in a long time. There's an opportunity in a policy sense, uh, there's a window coming open in which to change our paradigm, to change our mindset about what it takes to actually make every child a winner, to achieve all means all. Uh, and that's what this book is really about. Next. We know that even before the pandemic, um, we weren't as adults, as a community, as a society, meeting children's needs. And I won't read through these, but these are only a few examples of obvious ways in which we're falling short of providing children what those of us who have privilege routinely provide for our own children, sources of support and opportunity that make it possible for them to come to school ready to learn. So it wasn't good before the pandemic, it's gotten even worse in the pandemic, exacerbating these inequalities and we need to do something. Next, please. Other jurisdictions, other countries have figured out ways of meeting these needs. Uh, this is an example in Finland of the kinds of things, you know, we're often compared in the state, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to jurisdictions like Finland or Singapore. And uh, one of the chief differences when you look at their performance is the kind of baseline, the kind of framework, the kind of platform from which children come to school. Societies in which we have universal maternity leave or paternity leave for that matter, uh, career pathways, free higher education, early childhood education available for everyone, healthcare for everyone, low children's poverty, uh, basic nutrition for everyone. It's why I'm so thrilled about what's happening in the federal government now, which is an outright frontal assault on poverty, which will make a big difference in what we're able to accomplish in education uh, with children and will uh, provide families with the support and affordances that they need to thrive in this society. Next slide, please. Well, it all adds up to a conclusion that if our basic philosophy, as it has been for a long time, and particularly in the education reform era, and, and let me just uh, uh, clarify, I'm a big believer in education reform. I've spent a substantial amount of my career in education reform, but it didn't go far enough. You know, we, we proceeded with the assumption, you know, put in place really as far back as my uh, predecessor, if you will, as the first secretary of education in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and in the United States, Horace Mann, who believed that if we provided a high quality education to everybody, it would be the great equalizer in our society. That was a great theory and it actually worked pretty well in the early part of the 20th century, but as time uh, wore on, it became less and less effective at meeting the needs of the democracy, at meeting the needs of the labor force. Um, we needed a system of education that was much more encompassing. Uh, we're facing now automation of jobs and the offshoring of jobs and the need for everyone to have skills and knowledge at a level far higher than the kind of routine work that we did when our factory system of education was designed in the early 20th century. And we've asked schools to do lots of things that society as a whole and families as a whole used to be able to do. And they can't take on these responsibilities by themselves. They can't achieve world-class standards, uh, do um, social and emotional learning, 21st century skills, well-rounded education, uh, you know, and do nutrition and healthcare and driver education on top of it, all within the same time and with the same resources that we've had in the past. It's too much to ask. We've got to engage our communities and particularly to engage our communities in mitigating those factors that get in the way of children coming to school ready to learn. Next, please. So in order to do this, it's going to take structures and ways of organizing uh, that we haven't done in the past. We've been siloed. So we have 
health in one silo and we have criminal justice in another and housing in another and education in another. It's gonna take cross-sector collaboration. It's gonna take community collaboration in order to come together and basically construct a cradle to career pipeline that meets children where they are in early childhood and gives them what they need throughout their not only educational trajectory, but their life's journey so that they move from birth to eventually uh, through early childhood, through K-12, through higher education, and into a meaningful job that equips them to be 21st century high skill, high knowledge workers capable of supporting a family, that enables them to be informed citizens and leaders in our democracy, to be heads of family should they choose that, and lifelong fulfilled learners uh, capable of adapting to changes that we can't even foresee coming in our society. In order to do that, we can't just break down the silos because that's anarchy. We have silos to organize the complexity of human experience. We need to build new structures and the new structures that we envision have a lot to do with this uh, cross-sector collaboration that we're prescribing and the notion of children's cabinets. Next, please. The vision driving this work is a vision that again, is a direct uh, uh, contradiction of the one size fits all notion in education and instead moves toward personalization. Meet children where they are and give them what they need. A system of not just education, but child development for which whole communities take responsibility that support children and their needs, address their needs both inside and outside of school throughout their preschool and school years all the way to employment. That's the vision and the sort of principal strategy, meet them where they are, give them what they need of the new system. Next, please. So the good news is uh, this is not a revelation. This is not brand new. There have been a lot of organizations out in our country doing this kind of work or various facets of it for a long time. And uh, at, in the uh, Education Redesign Lab, we've been working closely in our By All Means initiative with a number of these organizations, learning from them and working with them to build and grow this field, which in the midst of this pandemic has suddenly moved to the center where I believe it should be of our conversation about what we in society need to do for our next generation of children. Next, please. And we've done, when I came back from government to the uh, Harvard Graduate School of Education, uh, I wanted to establish a center that would focus on broadening the scope of education reform, changing the education reform conversation from one of school optimization and the belief that if we simply improve schools, we get back to Horace Mann's vision of a, you know, schools being the great balance wheel of society. Uh, and instead have a, a system which takes into account a broader, bolder vision of what young people need in order to survive and thrive. And it's not rocket science, by the way. Again, those of us who have privilege have the affordances, the economic and social capital to be able to provide for our children 24 seven wraparound services from prenatal all the way till they're in their 20s and 30s. And the question is, if you don't happen to be fortunate enough through the accident of birth to have that kind of support, to, to, uh, to be able to attack those sorts of impediments that have marginalized you for reasons of racism or classism or poverty, one thing or another, uh, disability, um, uh, you don't speak the, main, the, the dominant language in the society, whatever it might be, um, we need to put in place a public platform, a default system that makes this possible for everyone. So in the Ed Redesign Lab, we have worked on you know, building a field, advocating for this different conception of the work. In our By All Means initiative, we've rolled up our sleeves and as you will hear, been involved with uh, dozens of communities across the country in helping them do this work on the ground, particularly with mayors and school superintendents. And then, you know, using our research capacity in a university to document what we and others 
have been able to do to um, uh, develop this way of approaching the challenge of educating all of our young people for success. So I'm gonna stop there and turn it over to my colleague, Lynn Sachs, to uh, take it up with you from here. Thank you, Paul. Um, that was a, a powerful statement of the theory of, of action underlying this really important work. So what we've done at the Education Redesign Lab, as Paul mentioned, is um, partner in a number of ways with communities that have basically bought into this theory of change that um, have decided to take action by building cross-sector collaborations within their own communities. And one of the things that we learned um, as we were doing that is that there was really a need for um, a more coherent, comprehensive set of material. Next slide, please. So, you know, while there is a lot of material already out there from some of the organizations that um, Paul had mentioned previously that have been working in this space for a while, uh, it still can be hard to access. It's in bits and pieces in different places. And in particular, it's been hard to find a combination of both the adaptive um, changes that communities need to make to really change their whole approach to thinking about uh, raising children as, as communities rather than just either, you know, separately as specific agencies and as schools. Um, and also the more practical step-by-step -step pieces so that we can merge, um, you know, the, the high level thinking and the, um, as Paul said, the what do we do Monday morning components of the work. So it's for that reason that we decided to write this book, um, which is based on the learnings from our, our close work with the bio means communities uh, over the past five years or so. Um, you know, we've had the, the opportunity and the privilege to work alongside of them, um, you know, to help in some ways and to learn in many ways. And one of our goals in starting that work was to document their experiences and to be able to share it out more broadly so that other communities that followed could benefit from that experience. Um, and that's, that's really what this represents. And then there's um, a broader network of communities that we've been working with as well um, in a looser sense. So we've also had that experience of, um, you know, hearing from those who have taken on different kinds of models for cross-sector collaboration and to be able to share those too. And I just want to acknowledge here before going forward that the work of the By All Means Consortium and our other cross-sector collaborative work has been headed by Bridget Rodriguez, who um, I think is with us. And I just want to uh, thank her for her leadership and, and Raina Hall at the Edry Design Lab, who have both really led this important work um, on which this book is based. Next slide, please. So just to give some framing on what we mean when we say collaborative action, it's the bringing together of multiple agencies and organizations and even individuals within communities to build systems together. So as Paul had mentioned, there is a siloing that happens naturally. Um, you know, different organizations have different mandates, different funding streams, um, different populations sometimes that they serve. And that can lead to fragmentation, to duplication. Um, you know, it's inefficient, and it it means that you know people are very um, limited in their view of what the problem is and what the solutions are. And bringing people together through cross sector collaboration has become an increasingly popular solution to that issue of fragmentation. And you know what what's clearly a failure um, across the country of. Um, you know, of our ability to the, uh, meet the needs of kids and to ensure their well-being, especially for kids who are living in poverty. There, there are few places um, that can point to real success um, when they continue to try to do it as separate functions rather than bringing, bringing people together to do it. So it's resonating with a lot of people. Um, it's something that more and more communities are taking up. And hopefully by walking through some of the steps that we've been able to identify, um, we'll be able to, um, to help move the field forward um, you know, by giving something of a roadmap for this work. Next. We have six components that we've identified and obviously there are more and these are overlapping in some ways, uh, but these feel to us like useful ways of um, 
identifying a, a process for communities to go through that they can really work from from one piece to another. And you know, you can see from the wave that the idea is that this is not a linear process. So you don't just um, you know take step one and then you're done with that and you move on to step two and you're done with that. Um, they do keep circling back. So you know, committing to leadership, obviously, that's a crucial foundational step. Um, but also something that needs to happen over and over again. Um, you know, first of all, leaders change over time. And second of all, the leadership needs change even when the leaders themselves don't. Um, but, but that commitment to leadership is a foundational piece for any of this work to go forward. Establish a children's cabinet um, can look very different in different communities, but taking that step to formalize a structure um, that has the authority uh, and the ability to carry forth collaborative action is really the core of, of what will carry this cross-sector work forward. We put embed equity and engage the community third, although in reality it's, it's first and embedded throughout, um, just so that when we're writing that chapter in the book, um, there's something concrete for it to draw from so that um, you know, readers have an understanding of what we're talking about. But it's obviously something that would be foundational for the entire effort. Um, and, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Taking strategic action is, is the piece where you decide as a community what priorities you have and what you actually want to do and make a commitment to doing them and carry those things out, you know, one and adding more and adding more until you have what's really a comprehensive set of, of activities that can change the trajectories for kids. Uh, data and progress, again, you know, that's um, an element that really needs to be at the beginning, middle and end um, of, of any initiative, but um, it's, uh, you know, something that uh, has different roles at different stages, and, and I'll talk more about that in a minute too. And then finally, ensuring sustainability. There are so many challenges for sustaining this work, um, and so in the book we address a number of them and, and ways that communities have and can um, overcome some of those. Next. So what I'll spend the next few minutes doing is just walking through um, this basic structure and giving a taste of what we cover in the book in each of these chapters um, so that you can get a sense of um, both the underlying theory for uh, each of these elements and also some of the practical elements of carrying them out. So as I mentioned already, the first important piece is for leaders to commit to doing this. That means taking a stand for um, having a community-wide approach for addressing the needs of kids. And in most communities that haven't already taken some kind of um, steps in this direction, this is really transformational. Um, it's changing the role of the mayor or the city manager or whoever the municipal leader is. Um, it's changing the relationships between agencies and changing the role of the superintendent, um, forming new partnerships. So it's, it's really the commitment and recognizing um, that without the success of kids, there's no success for the community. Um, and so it, it can be uh, frankly daunting uh, for, for mayors and municipal leaders to take this on because it is, it's a big messy problem um, and mayors often don't have formal authority over the schools and can therefore stand to the side a little if they choose um, and say that it's not really their responsibility. Um, so we really admire those who have stepped into this space and it's an increasing number uh, who are willing to put their political capital on the line and um, you know, really make it a central priority. Um, but that is the first piece. Next. And we, we define um, some specific roles um, for mayors and then you know, following this for superintendents because it does represent a pretty substantial shift um, in, in their way of doing business. So you know, first mayors need to choose to partner with superintendents in school districts, uh, particularly in cities and communities where, uh, where the mayor doesn't already have a formal role. This means outreach um, you know, and creating new kinds of relationships that didn't exist before. Um, and creating a public movement for children, as, as important as it is to build specific organizational partnerships, um, none of this will succeed without the community understanding that it is the community's responsibility to take this on. Um, you know, and so 
within the by all means communities, we've seen um, you know, some very effective public framing um, in, in Salem, Massachusetts, for example, our Salem, our kids, um, you know, is the, the framing um, uh, naming of the, um, of the initiative and it's really been a community-wide effort to draw in people from across the community to understand the needs of kids, to understand that um, raising, raising kids is everybody's responsibility, whether or not they're parents, whether or not they're teachers, whether they work directly with kids, um, and to just shift the perspective um, so that it's something that everybody within the community comes to have a different expectation of. Um, and then convening a children's cabinet or other cross-sector body, um, and we'll talk more about that later. Raise, braid, and, and reallocate funds. Uh, you know, this is um, one of the ways that mayors and city leaders and, and um, uh, other municipal leaders can have a really effective role um, is through the purse strings. It, you know, as we know, that's one of the key elements in the success of any initiative is having sustainable funding for it. Um, and then finally committing staffing, you know, and so some of these we'll talk about more um, in the final, um, the final element on sustainability because they're all elements that affect the long term sustainability of the effort, um, but these are uh, ways that mayors and uh, city leaders can directly get involved in um, shaping this and, and leading it. Next. And for superintendents, you know, as Paul mentioned earlier, schools are asked to do more and more and more, um, you know, with generally not much more in the way of resources or time or staffing. So, you know, superintendents already know what the need is. They understand, uh, you know, that, that they and their teachers are being asked to meet so many needs for kids. You know, I mean, um, you know, everything from, you know, as Paul says, driver's ed to, um, you know, uh, feeding kids and now, you know, tech support. <laughs> um, you know, schools are asked to, to fill all sorts of, of different roles. So for the most part, superintendents are more than eager to have um, support and partnerships. On the other hand, you know, it can obviously um, feel a little bit complicated to cede authority, especially to those who may seem to have less knowledge of children and, and child development. So, um, you know, one of the key functions for superintendents is to identify the specific role for schools and the partnership that schools can um, form with the other organizations and agencies. So, um, you know, to define how those different relationships fit together and to be clear about their areas of need. So superintendents are in the best position to, um, to identify what needs they're not able to fully meet. I mean, you know, oftentimes these have to do with, um, you know, with health needs, with mental health. I mean, you know, when we first started this work, um, we were surprised to hear superintendent after superintendent identify mental health as the single greatest need um, that kids were facing that they were unable to meet. And that, that was before the pandemic, um, you know, so you can only imagine how, um, how intense that need is now. Um, and educating the mayor and community leaders, you know, the, the other leaders within the community don't necessarily have the expertise that the superintendents have. So there's just a, a crucial function there um, for superintendents to, um, to be able to fill that role. And then to embrace partnerships, it's really a, a broadening um, of the tent so that, um, you know, there's a welcoming in of, of support um, from others. Next. So then we turn to talking about establishing a children's cabinet itself, um, because, you know, as we've already made clear, this is the vehicle for bringing people together for decision making, for identifying needs, for looking at data. Um, and, uh, you know, without that, you just have, um, you know, sort of people whose intentions are good, but don't really have a formal structure. In our view, in, in the by all means communities, these should be mayor or um, city leader, municipal leader led um, because that brings people to the table in a way that nothing else can really um, do. And 
brings resources and attention to the issue. Um, so for that reason, within BioMeans, that's, that's been the primary model. There are a couple of examples in our communities um, that look different, but we've also seen really effective models um, elsewhere through other collective impact efforts uh, that, that aren't um, following that same structure. So, you know, children's cabinets can uh, have a variety of forms, but the key is to establish that structure. Next. It, this is just a, a highlighting of um, how broadly spread just the communities with which we've been working are across the country. So the ones here in blue are those that are part of our BioMeans Consortium, and we've been working intensively with them um, over the past five years or so. And then the, the ones in white are part of the local children's cabinet network, um, which is a, a broader consortium that we um, co-lead with the Forum for Youth Investment and the Children's Funding Project. And it, these have really quite a range of forms. You'll notice that there are some counties represented here. Um, uh, you know, there's really quite a, a range of approaches to children's cabinets. Um, and so there doesn't have to be just a single model. Next. And we, we do lay out in the book different options for cabinet structures. Um, so there's a governmental cabinet, which is just usually city or municipal agencies a collaborative cabinet that broadens to coalitions and collaboratives. So still, you know, very much at the organizational level, but not just governmental ones. And then public cabinets that are broader still um, and, and often will have um, representation from community-based organizations, youth advocates, um, philanthropy from unions. So these are the broadest and, and the most common that we've, um, that we've seen and the most common within the, the BioMeans Consortium. What you choose within your community uh, depends on what your needs are and uh, you know, what your constraints are. So um, you know, there, there are different ones that work well for different people for different reasons um, and different advantages and disadvantages to each. So you know, Denver, for example, has a governmental cabinet that brings together all of the city agencies. And one of the advantages is that that gives them the capability to look at all funding um, that touches kids within the cabinet. So, you know, anything um, related to children's funding is, um, you know, kind of consolidated in a way that it hadn't been before. And they look at data very intensively to see even within specific neighborhoods where there are greatest needs um, and where, um, you know, where they might be able to leverage new investment or new opportunities. Uh, and there's a sort of an ability to act um, because that is all under the city control. Um, but on the other hand, the broader cabinets, you know, both uh, have the ability to bring in um, outside partners who can, um, you know, provide additional assistance. And, you know, then there's a key question of representation on the cabinets. Um, so, so the public cabinets are the broadest generally in terms of representation. Next. One of the key issues that we've encountered as we've been working with communities um, is to be very clear about what actions the cabinet can take. Um, I'm not going to talk through these, but um, these are some of the things that we talk about in the book in terms of what the cabinets actually do and what they spend their time on and what the function is to make sure that once you bring people together, um, that you actually understand what the cabinet will be doing and how to create important roles um, for people and help them see their place within the work. Next. And to support the cabinet, it's important to create a backbone function. And by backbone, what we mean is, um, you know, either a person or an organization that can support the cabinet effort because this takes time, it takes a lot of energy. Uh, and if you try to carry the work of the cabinet forward just by using time in the margins, um, you know, that uh, people with full-time jobs try to carve out, uh, it's, it's very hard to carry the work forward. So thinking about how to fill that 
function um, first, you know, often in a pretty informal way and then increasingly formally um, is one of the, the key steps for cabinets um, to take towards sustainability. Next. And we just have, have some specific advice on how to structure the cabinet's work. There's more in the book, um, you know, that clarifies what meetings can look like and what some of the activities are um, for cabinets to take on. Next. So turning to the, the issue of equity, as I said earlier, equity is, is foundational to cross-sector collaborative work for kids in communities. Um, you know, there's really no example I can think of um, where equity wasn't the founding reason for forming the collaboration. Um, you know, everything that Paul said at the beginning of the talk about the need is what drives communities to take this work on. And yet that doesn't necessarily translate automatically to um, actions that embed equity and center equity within collaborative work. Um, and so we've, we've taken this chapter to um, highlight ways that collaboratives can, um, can frame their work with an equity lens and can embed it throughout, um, throughout different stages of their work. Next. Um, and so, you know, we start just by um, uh, underscoring the importance of acknowledging the community's history of, of racism and of its current reality. Um, you know, it's, it's very much um, in people's minds and the news and their lived experiences right now. And keeping that at the center of the work um, and understanding how that's impacting people in different roles is one of the important steps for understanding how to build solutions. Next. Um, using data to improve equity. Um, so thinking of data, not just as, as some kind of a neutral um, undertaking, but, uh, but using data to unearth uh, where there are inequities to, um, to think of data as uh, helping to frame solutions, as highlighting um, and spotlighting um, bright spots um, are also um, key elements of, of embedding equity. And then next, thinking about community representation and engagement. So, you know, it's often the case that leadership within communities doesn't look like the communities themselves, um, you know, in terms of uh, race and economic background and disability and, and other characteristics. So, um, intentionally building in community engagement in a variety of ways. Um, so we give just a couple of examples um, here and there, there are others in the book um, from, you know, uh, holding broad-based community grassroots summits, um, you know, as opportunities to hear from a broad swath of the community to having long-term bodies um, that represent community members that have a formal role on the cabinet and can advise the cabinet. Next. And uh, um, I'm just gonna sort of skim past these, but um, you know, thinking of the strategies for action, um, uh, you know, with equity in mind so that um, you can target those who need support the most, uh, you know, while looking at the community as a whole. Next. And then the fourth key component is, is actually taking strategic action. Um, it's, you know, obviously the, the heart of making change is to take on activities that will, um, that will shift outcomes. So next, um, you know, a first important step is to identify the gaps between what the community already has and is doing um, and, and where they want to be. Next. And then to, to think about what, um, what constitutes high impact and sustainable strategies. Um, so to be very intentional about the kinds of activities that communities take on, next. Um, and then here are some examples of points of entry um, that communities tend to take. So you want to, um, you know, sort of pair the, um, the, sustainable strategy, the criteria for choosing high impact strategies with 
um, points of entry that the community may already be taking on, um, you know, and being able to build on that work or where there's funding opportunity where you know you can have impact. Um, you know, and these will these will vary from place to place and all often will build over time so that you can um, add on um, more pieces to the community, to the uh, cabinet's work. And as a piece of this next, it's really important to think of a framing of uh, cradle to career so that it doesn't seem just like a bunch of, you know, different but unrelated initiatives, but to envision how these different pieces fit within a broader frame of support that can, you know, carry from really from birth all the way through post-secondary and hopefully to uh, um, gainful employment and, and um, you know, all the qualities that, that Paul was talking about earlier, being able to support a family if you choose and, and be a contributing member of society. Next. Um, so we highlighted here one of our other um, key initiatives within the Education Redesign Lab, and this is um, personalization, as Paula mentioned earlier, is one of um, the, the key actions um, that we would like to see communities take. Uh, I won't go into this here, but it's just one example of, of what communities might take on. Next. And a fifth key component is to uh, use data and measure progress at every stage of the process. Next. It really involves a, creating a positive feedback loop between the goals, the actions, and the data. Next. Um, and to think about that in complex ways um, that can match the complexity of structural and systemic change. Um, and so we, we developed a framework called the measures of success that um, helps to differentiate the different types of actions and then the different ways of measuring progress for those actions along the way from um, understanding what committed leadership looks like um, and being able to document that along with investment and sustainability um, and then capturing the actions and finally um, you know, being able to uh, identify what measures uh, communities can use to track access to services and also child and youth impact eventually. You know, as we know, um, you know, it can often feel when you're working on um, initiatives that there's um, an incentive to be able to show um, impact almost immediately, even though some of these take quite a long time. And that's even more true for collaborative action. First, you have to build the structure. Then you have to decide on the actions that you're taking, put those in place. And then finally, you can see what the impact is on the kids that you're um, intending uh, to help. But since that, that doesn't all happen at once, seeing the steps along the way and understanding what measures you can identify along the way um, is uh, you know, something that can um, be really constructive for showing progress and helping to sustain the effort. Next. Um, let's just move to the next one. And so we've also identified criteria for choosing metrics that will have impact. Um, these, are, these are five criteria that can be helpful in thinking about what to choose, what to identify, and, and what to measure to make sure that there's a tight fit between uh, the theory and the measures um, and, and that you're using the measures in the most constructive way possible. Next. And of course, it's important to share data across sectors. One of the important functions of the cabinet is uh, for people with different um, sets of data from different agencies and organizations uh, to bring them together so that there's a much richer, broader picture um, of the children in your community. And then also um, to be able to think in terms of accountability for, um, for different organizations um, and having everybody see their role in reaching those broader long-term goals. Next. Okay, um, I'm going to turn it back to Paul now to talk about sustainability um, and then to wrap it up.
Muted. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, I'm going to run through this pretty quickly because we've gone longer than we intended and we wanted to leave some time for questions. So I will say we're going to stay around past five o'clock. I know some of you won't be able to, but if you have questions, uh, we'll, we'll be here for a few minutes after five o'clock. So one of the things that uh, is important in this work, particularly as we hinge our work upon the leadership of mayors, we frequently get the question of how do you sustain this, particularly if mayors leave? Uh, number one, our rationale for mayors is this is a civic responsibility, not a school responsibility. We're talking about the entire ecosystem, and therefore um, the mayor has the power to project to the community this is a top priority civic responsibility. Everybody needs to be involved, and the, the mayor has the influence to get everybody to the table. Nonetheless, when they do, uh, and mayors come and go with elections, you need to sustain it. So we need to pay some attention to sustaining. Next, please. Uh, a, key, um, a key factor in, in sustaining, Lynn has already mentioned, you need staff to carry through on the good ideas that a cabinet comes up with in terms of its strategies. But if all the staff is fragmented in different agencies and there's no common staff, you won't move the work forward. I, uh, in, at one point in my career, I established an organization like this and became the backbone staff to it. And the day-to-day -day work of carrying this forward was absolutely critical to uh, our success as a, as a cabinet. Next, please. Here are some, uh, we won't go into these, so let's skip to the next slide, but this is just quickly uh, some of the skills and knowledge, and particularly with an audience that includes a lot of students, these are things to be thinking about in terms of the skills to do this kind of cross-sector interagency kind of work. Next, please. Uh, you have to develop a long-term funding strategy. Fortunately, we're in a good moment now with money flowing, but for every community, they need to create a fiscal map to find the money and then begin to align it, and then, you, then off the base that we have to generate new funds. Next, please. Uh, we need active communications in a whole variety from social media to, um, to standard media publications to self-published uh, uh, materials. Uh, keeping this vision in front of the community, you want to, through public engagement, be building the demand for this kind of service and support for this new sort of children's cabinet entity that will persist and be demanded by citizens even after a mayor goes on to the next stage and you get a new mayor. Next. Children's cabinets are ideal venues and catalysts for conceiving of what we want as a future for our children not just for planning programs, although that kind of gap analysis we talk about is important to do, but also working together on that vision. And as it includes uh, advocacy for policies that attack some of the root cause, the root causes of some of the uh, challenges that face children and their families in our communities, changing policies that have to do with eliminating food deserts, providing mental health services, providing health care, clean air, clean water, whatever it might be, and making the budgetary investments to, to make those policies come to life. So the advocacy is an important part of the communication and collaboration work we do. Next, please. So we do have a moment, and I've, you know, I've said this several times before, but uh, you know, a tidal wave has, has revealed the ocean floor and the gross inequities that are on that floor about which we as a society need to do something. And next, please. Now's the time to step up and do it. People are paying attention. We have an, we have an opportunity to seize this moment. We've got an administration in Washington who seems to see children as a priority in terms of building a healthy, prosperous future for this nation. Next. And we believe deeply in local communities and the capacity of our local communities to, to, um, to do this work. We, and and uh, this pandemic has sort of in the spirit of a opportunity within a crisis, given our local communities an unprecedented opportunity uh, to seize this moment, to redesign the way we think of our social compact and what we do for children in our communities. So that's the work we're about. Next, please. 
That's what we're documenting. The Ed Redesign Lab has a whole host of resources in addition to this book. Uh, we thank you for your time and attention. Please uh, throw any questions you have into a chat, into the chat, and we'd be happy to respond to those. Or it's a small enough group, people could just pipe up if you if you like, unmute yourself, and uh, uh, let's take it from here. Thank you, Paul and Lynn. That was terrific. Um, got a couple of questions, and I think you touched you just touched on this at the end there, Paul. About you know we've talked a lot. Um, excuse me, and various. Um, conversations about some of the, the silver linings or some of the that have come out of COVID. And I think your point about spotlight, the spotlight on the gaps that were there beforehand and this increased urgency to address those as, as one of those main takeaways. Yeah, uh, no, this is a, this is a particular moment, but I will say on top of that, it's a particular moment where uh, unusually we have a fair number of resources coming into our field to support uh, this kind of work and with a holistic conception uh, of what it takes to get the work done. But, uh, you know, a strong um, <clears throat> challenge, a big challenge that we're all facing is how to spend this money well and wisely, because it's not the quantity of money, it's the quality of how we spend it. And if we spend it poorly, it will wind up being an argument that um, uh, opponents of this kind of work will use to defund schools and child development going forward. So it's especially important, and we feel in our local communities, um, you know, these children's cabinets have an opportunity to show how this work can be effective and make a difference and get real outcomes for children. So guys, we're, we're undoubtedly going to have some examples of waste and misspending with this money coming down. We need some uh, counterbalancing examples of the way in which the money's made a difference. And we'd, uh, we, we think our, our children's cabinets are in a good position to deliver those. So building on that point, you know, the your conversation, your work is focused on the local level, like local communities. Are there opportunities for scaling this up or on the point about the, the funding, are there opportunities where um, we think it's giving more direction? you don't want to take ownership away from the local communities but is there are there guidelines that can be applied more generally yeah i think that um you know again the uh, the, the 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 funds that are available now um make this uh, an opportune moment uh increasingly the recognition that these factors are important and need to be addressed uh, is driving more people to think about this work and how to do the work. Uh, as Lynn demonstrated, we have a growing local children's cabinet network uh, under Bridget Rodriguez's leadership that, uh, and in partnership with several other organizations, the Forum for Youth Investment and the Children's Funding Project, um, that um, you know, is, is dealing with expanded demand from around the country. To top that off, a number of the big foundations in this country, foundations like Hewlett and, and Balmer and the Blue Meridian Group, uh, are uh, thinking deeply and investing in what, generally speaking, is called place-based work, which is this kind of work in local communities. Also, all the signs point in the direction of an expanding movement, and, uh, and part of our work at the Ed Redesign Lab is to support the growth of that movement. Okay, great. A um, couple of questions here. Um, excuse me, if I look to the other screen. Um, since mayors don't um, often don't have an official role at overseeing local school districts, what motivates them to make education and child well-being a central part of their agenda? Then you want to take that one. You spoke to it earlier. Sure. Um, you know, so first I, I'd say um, not not all do, um, but increasingly it's clear, and and I think that you know this is one of the the silver linings of the pandemic. It's been impossible to ignore um, how important schools are and other child serving organizations are, and just the well being um, of children is to community. So um, you, you can't ignore it anymore if you ever thought you could, um, frankly. And so, you know, there were there were mayors and, and uh, municipal leaders who had already recognized that, um, you know, and had understood that, you know, if they didn't change um, the approach to uh, meeting kids' needs, that they could never be successful as communities. 
Um, and there are those who are discovering it now, um, you know, and who realize just, you know, in part the vast array of services uh, that schools had been providing um, that go beyond education already, you know, from school meals, um, mental health services, conduits for other kinds of services. Um, and, you know, it's frankly an overwhelming amount um, to ask schools to do. And, and it's increasingly um, been overwhelming to schools to do. So, uh, you know, I think part of it is just, you know, sort of the, the natural, um, impact of, of seeing that happen. And then, you know, in some cases, uh, it's about making the case to the mayor um, or the municipal leader uh, for the importance of this. So, so sometimes it, it is truly mayor led um, and other times there's a bit of a push involved uh, from others. So it's important to make the case. Yeah, the mayors I talked to in this work have for a long time, I mean, after all the origin of the education reform movement that began in the nineties was <clears throat> civic leaders, governors, and business people coming forward and saying, you know, if we don't have a high quality human capital development system in our communities, if we don't develop the talent we have, we have no economy, we have no workers, we have no consumers, we have no place for our employees to live, we have no future citizens to maintain a civil discourse and leadership in our community. I mean, the whole health and well-being of our community rests on whether we develop the talent that we have. And this has never been more true for us as a nation than it is now. And I think um, enlightened mayors all over the country see this. It's just they're, they're not clear what to do about it. And it's why the kind of solution that we're offering in terms of children's cabinets, we think gives them something they can do on Monday morning uh, to begin to bring together the assets of their communities to address uh, the kinds of uh, challenges that we've been talking about. So based on that and the central role that the mayors play, is it, are, they, are, the, are the mayors the first person that you need to get on board with this work? Well, I'd say, you know, both mayors and superintendents are the hub of the wheel. The school system is where the children are. It's like why bank robbers go to banks. That's where the money is. Uh, but superintendent, the children are in the schools and that's our main youth serving institution in most communities. But we don't want to say schools are responsible for doing all these other things that they don't have the capacity to do. So what we have done in recruiting people for our by all means initiative um, was to look for mayors who had this vision of the importance of human capital and developing talent to their community and then make sure that in their communities they had a superintendent who, was, uh, who shared that kind of a vision and was open to partnership, was open to uh, opening up the buildings for the school system to work in partnership with others. So those two factors in terms of community leadership are, is, has been prerequisite to high quality work in, in this domain. Okay. So a couple of questions come in on um, turnover, especially the leaders, leadership position. So can you speak about the um, partnership for health. We, this on this question, they're saying that we have an origin story of incredible founders that have gone through 75% turnover in our leadership circle and are on our third mayor. So it seems like there's a lot of uh, high, high turnover rate there. Then you want to talk to them? Yeah. Um, I mean, turnover is such a challenge, um, you know, but on the other hand, it's, um, it's something that you can anticipate. There will be turnover in leadership roles. Um, and because of that, there are some strategies um, you can take on to help mitigate against the effects of that. Um, you know, one is to institutionalize the work as possible um, because if it's overly reliant on um, just the, the knowledge and energy of a couple of individuals, then when those people leave, things can really fall apart. Um, so that's that's one piece. Um, the other is to spread it as broadly as possible, so that it's not um, just living, you know, within one or two people, um, you know, but that there are multiple people who are driving the work forward, and you know, the loss of any one at a given time um, has less of an impact. Uh, and another that uh, that some communities have done that we found really useful is to create a journey map, um, and that's something we talk about in the book, um, so that those who come in can more easily see what's happened before um, and can step into the work, um, you know, knowing what's already happened and you don't feel like you're reinventing um, things all the time when new people come in. 
Community demand is, is just crucial. I mean, if you give people service and supports and opportunities that they haven't had before that have value for them, then even if a mayor leaves, they're still going to want those and they're going to ask the next mayor, the next city council to make those services available. So I think one of the most urgent uh, uh, tasks that people who establish these cabinets have is building community demand, which requires them to engage the community in designing the services and supports that the cabinet will be working on so that they have a sense of ownership that will continue beyond the uh, tenure of any particular leader. And I would say that's also where the communication function comes in. Um, you know, sometimes I think that the cabinets forget to share um, their, their progress and their successes more broadly, but um, it can be so powerful uh, to hear what's happening. Um, and so that communications function, uh, you know, will, will make it much harder, um, you know, for, um, for things to fall apart because people want that to continue, as Paul said. Great, thank you. This is terrific. Um, I'm gonna, uh, that looks like all the questions that we have in the q and if folks want to in the next couple of minutes, put another question in there. Otherwise, um, I will, turn things over to Ann. Um, and thank you, Paul and Lynn. Thank, thank you, you, Laura. Thanks, everyone. Uh, that was a great discussion. And my, um, there was a discount on the books thing that was on that opening slide. Yes, that will be going uh, via email to uh, um, all of our attendees. You'll, you should be getting it tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody, for the time and attention. We, we certainly appreciate it. Uh, this is more than just about the book. The book's uh, hopefully a tool, but it's about a movement, and it's about a movement that really centers on equity and doing better, especially by those children who we've least well served in our communities historically. So we welcome your interest in this. We'd love to... Uh, uh, connect with you in any way we can to help you if you have an interest in pursuing this kind of work. Thank you. Bye all. Bye. Bye.